The Magi is such a random and interesting story. You know, it's, it's such a strange event. It's, it's not what you'd really expect to see at the birth of the Messiah. I mean, we don't really know what should have happened, but when you think about it, that three or that people came and randomly gave this baby in a manger random gifts and just showed up there in your house with your baby and your, your mother and the child. Kind of an odd story. But it's a great story. It's, it's a wonderful story. We know it well. I mean, we sing songs that hail three kings who came from the Orient. We talk about wise men who came from the East to, to praise and worship this newborn king of kings, the, the Messiah, the savior of the world. We talk about how their three gifts symbolize that they understood who this baby was going to be, the gold that would represent that he is the king of kings and the incense that he is God with us, that he is, God is present with us, and the myrrh that would represent the, the kind of death that he would die on our behalf. And, and while Jesus would be and, and do all those things, I kind of wonder, it, did the Magi really get it? Did they really understand all these things? You know, Matthew includes this in the gospel, but to understand why Matthew would include this story at all, we need to know who the Magi really were and how the Jews of Jesus' day would have understood Magi. You know, we need the real Magi to please stand up. Because the problem with well-known stories like these that, that are in every children's message, every every story we hear all the time about, about the Christmas nativity scene is that sometimes we forget to look at what the gospel actually tells us. We know the story and, and certain details that have kind of been added to add luster to the story. Seep in. You see, the, the legend or the story that they were three kings didn't actually begin until the 6th century when the Roman emperor became a Christian. And it makes sense, right? Then when, when the Christian, when the emperor is now a Christian, the, the emperor of the, the largest empire in, in the world has now become a Christian. Oh, of course, the, the people that came to visit Jesus must have been kings here to, to, to worship the king of kings, to recognize the emperor of emperors, as it were. But that's not really what the text tells us. So, okay, maybe they're, maybe they're not kings. That's not a, a hard pill for us to swallow, but certainly they were wise men, right? They, they understood the signs. They came and, and worshipped the baby. But it, the interesting thing is that they had never been called wise men before the 18th century. Before the, the 1700s when the Enlightenment era came. And man decided that we were smart enough to find all the answers. That we knew everything. We could find out the answers even about God by our own wisdom. So these, these magi must have just been really smart men ahead of their time that came to, to visit the baby Jesus. But that's not really what the, the text tells us. You know, they, they weren't really kings. They weren't really magi. And you might be protesting, well, what about the gifts? Surely those point to who this baby would be. Well, the fact is that, that the gifts that they brought were pretty common gifts to give to a king. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh, they were expensive gifts. They were gifts that were suited for a king. But they would have given those to any other king. The problem is that, that we often translate the one Greek word to that they came to worship when it might be better translated they came to pay homage to. They came to honor, to pay respect to the king just like they would any other king. You see, these magi weren't necessarily the, the wise men that we think they were. You know, all the, all the signs that make us think that they're wise men, right? The star that they followed, well, God made the star rise and, and directed them where they needed to go. And then they went to where they would expect a king to be found, to the palace, and, and there the scribes reveals them the prophecy which God had given to the prophet in the Old Testament times of, of where the Messiah would be born. So again, that's, that's God's work. And then the interesting thing is the, that Herod and the scribes and chief priests are, are shocked when the Magi appear. They're, they're bewildered and troubled. So it seems like the star wasn't really seen by everybody, but maybe just the Magi themselves. 
And then as they leave and they head towards Bethlehem, then the star reappears and directs them to where the actual baby, the mothering child, will be found. And when they get there, and after they're, they're going to leave and they're going to return to Herod because they don't see his megalomania, they don't see that he's going to protect his kingdom at any cost. And so they're going to go back to Herod. And God has to warn them in a dream. You know, all these things, all these signs and all the things that the Magi have done, they don't prove their wisdom, they prove their ignorance. It proves that they didn't really know what they were doing. But, and, and as we look at where the word Magi comes from, so we need, we need to look for where the, the real Magi did. Please stand up. And, and the only other place in Scripture that the word Magi occurs is in the Old Testament, in, in Daniel 2, as I have written up there, that when Nebuchadnezzar had this dream and he demanded that people tell him what the dream was and interpret it. And he called in the, the wizards, the magi, or, or astrologers, or enchanters, as, as it's often translated, or the sorcerers, but they, they couldn't do it. You see, the magi, to people of Jesus' day, would have been pagans, outsiders, people that practice things in direct opposition to the, the law of Moses. They would have been scorned and ridiculed. They're the last people we should expect to see at the birth of the Jewish Messiah. And yet, God has brought them there. God brought these people to his son. God brought them to see, to witness his son's birth, to, to be there and, and to see this newborn king of kings. So if they, if they weren't sorcerers, if they were, I mean, if they weren't wise men, if they weren't kings and they were sorcerers, then why does Matthew include them in his gospel? What is he, what is he trying to tell us? What is Matthew trying to, to say to his readers by including them in this story? Well, you see, all the, all the worthwhile things in this story are done by God. But God works in mysterious ways. God works in ways that are contrary to what we would expect. You see, Matthew chapter 2, the, the whole chapter is kind of a contrast between what the world expects a king to be, where the world expects a king to be found, how the world of power works in, in this world, and where God's king is found, where the true king is found, how God works. And, and it's contrary to often our human wisdom. You see, the Magi went to the royal city, to the holy palace, to find the king adorned in, in this noble area. But that's not where God had his king. God had his son born in a lowly manger, born to humble beginnings. You see, God brings the Magi, these outsiders, into his story. The, the whole story of the Magi is not about their wisdom, but it's, it's about their fundamental ignorance. They don't get it. They never get it. All, all the worthwhile things in this story have been revealed to them by God. You know, the, the star, well, that was God's work. The prophecy, well, that was God's work. Getting them to the actual child, you know, having the star settle over, over where the, the baby and the child and the mother would be, well, that's God's work. It's not their work. You know, they, they, they would have gone back to Herod, so God getting him away from there and, and saving the child, again, that's God's work. In the whole story, the, the Magi act like ignorant outsiders. They ask the wrong questions. They ask the wrong people. They go to the wrong place. They can't see anything worthwhile. This whole story is about how God works even with these outsiders, even with our ignorance, in spite of our ignorance. You see, we're a lot like the Magi. We often act like ignorant outsiders. We often act like the pagan people. We, we ask the wrong questions. We look in the wrong places for answers. We go to the wrong places. We'd be completely lost without God coming to us, without God revealing these mysteries to us. God revealed his son, the Messiah, to the Magi. God brought them into his story of salvation. And God works the same way for us. He brings us into his story of salvation. He brings us into his story. He comes and he finds us. He came down from heaven, humbled himself, and became a, a child in a manger. He came and he dwelled among us. He came and did the unexpected and paid the price that we owed as he went to the way of the cross and did the completely unexpected 
You see, God, in his wisdom, God, the, God, the, in the wisdom of God, though the world through, apparently I can't speak. In the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believed. And the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. This whole story of the Magi, Matthew is telling us that God draws those that weren't part of the kingdom, that weren't, didn't seem to be part of the promise, that didn't seem to have value, the people that were furthest from the kingdom, the people that were practicing things opposed to, to what had been revealed in Mosaic law. God draws them into his promise, draws them into his story. And he draws us into his story. You see, the incarnation reveals that, that God has come farther than you could possibly know, and yet that he is closer than you could possibly imagine. He is here with you. He has come to find you. What a blessing that is to know that, that our God does not leave us to try and find our own answers, does not leave us to try and figure things out on our own, but he comes and he reveals these things to you. He shows his love to you through his son. He comes and he draws you to himself so that you might have forgiveness, have that restored relationship with him. He doesn't leave it up to us. And so as we, as we continue to celebrate this Christmas season, we're just so thankful that, that Jesus came here to be one of us and to draw us back to God. And now may that truth, may that hope, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.